I want to start this conversation. It's a little different than what we usually do here in the tent because I'm going to ask you to be engaged in it. We're going to talk among ourselves, a our carefully hand-selected panel, and then I'm going to come and pick your brains for what you think about what we've just been talking about. The topic is American identity. And I want to start by asking you to think for a moment about me. Who do you think I am? When you look at me and you see me on the stage, do you see me as the lady in the anchor chair? Do you see me as a black person, as a woman? Do you think see me as someone you know or have never heard of before? Either way, however you have come up with a conclusion about who I am, it is informed by who you are. Last night, a sixth black church burned in the South, another AME church. Your first thought when you heard about this, was it arson or was it an accident? A young black man is killed or a young woman is raped on a college campus. Your first thought, whose fault? A same-sex couple moves in next door to you and your first thought is property values up, property values down. That is affected by who you are and what you bring to it. It's kind of like taking a picture with Instagram. If I took a picture of you right now with this, you would look colorful or you could be washed out. You might be sepia toned. You might be completely lacking in any kind of definition. But that's because I get to choose what that means. So when I ask you these questions, I want you to ponder them, but you don't have to say the answers out loud. Because in any case, the filters are what matters in this conversation we're about to have. It's all about American identity, how we see ourselves and how we see each other. So, behind me, you see an amazing and honorable panel. Elizabeth Alexander is many things. She's an artist, she was a poet. She composed praise song for the day for the inauguration, the first inauguration of President Barack Obama. She is a black woman, obviously. Next to her is James Fallows our token white man, as he just said to me. <laughs> Jim, Fallow, Jim Fallows has traveled the world looking at America from the outside in for the Atlantic as a national correspondent. And he has a unique view of how we see ourselves and how others see us as well. Next to him is Ashanti Branch. Ashanti Branch has decided to save black boys one person at a time. He's from Oakland, California. He's an educator. And he's also a brother who wears his hair in dreads. He also has a degree in civil engineering and another master's in education, something your filter may not have known unless you looked him up. Next to him is Michelle Norris, my friend Michelle Norris, who is a host and special correspondent for NPR. In addition to that, and you may have remembered this if you were in this hall last year when we did this project, Michelle founded, curated, created something called the Race Card Project in which she asks people to think about race in six words, which has turned into an amazing treasure trove, if you haven't seen it online, of the way we think about ourselves and the way we talk about ourselves. Next to Michelle is Ajahn Poo. Ajahn Poo is director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and she's co-director of Caring Across Generations campaign. She co-founded Domestic Workers United, which helped pass New York's Domestic Workers Bill of Rights in 2010. She's also an Asian American woman and brings her own veil of experience to our conversation. You can see this is all very carefully worked out. And finally, to my left is Joe Echeverria. He's chairman and CEO of the MBK Alliance, my brother's keeper alliance, which you just heard Valerie Jarrett talk about a short time ago with Walter. It's working to eliminate gaps and opportunities for men, young boys of color. He's also a recently retired uh, chairman, CEO of Deloitte. He also is Puerto Rican from the South Bronx and brings that to his worldview. So I wanna start our conversation here, and then I wanna continue the conversation with you. First, by talking to my esteemed panel and asking them to answer this question, starting with you, Elizabeth. When you think of the American identity, whether it's through your veil of experience or through your expertise as an artist who sees the world in a very unique way, what do you see? Well, that's a question. Um, 
I see an identity that is constantly changing. I think about it as an educator more than anything. Uh, I teach African American studies at Yale University, and my version of the Common Core has Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs and Gwendolyn Brooks and Lucille Clifton, voices who have tried to articulate what it means to speak sometimes from what is called the margin, but with a full voice. I think that if you look back in American literature and you think about someone like Walt Whitman, who also cast his sights across the land and thought about and wrote about what is Americanness? Well, it's many things. Do I contradict myself? Walt Whitman wrote very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. So he was speaking about the self, but he was speaking about the self in the larger polis. And I think that the, the sort of plain spoken way that he gives us that very profound truth, which I love most seeing in Philadelphia on a beautiful, beautiful mural in West Philly, um, and, and it's gorgeous. And looking at it in that neighborhood with a picture of a young black boy with his hands thrown to the sky makes me understand one of the many ways that poetry matters every single day. Um, I think that he doesn't tie up with a bow this idea of what we are. Multiculturalism is dynamic, but it is what we are. This country is many, many things. It is changing, but I think if we think about who we are in our racial identities in particular, which I speak to out of my scholarship, I think that to understand that people of color and our voices are at the center of Americanness from the very beginning is a way to kind of flip the script and, and think about who we are. Jim? I'm gonna to come to a similar destination from a, from a, a different uh, tra trajectory. So my people are Scottish and English and, and German. They hold came- Hold your mic a little closer. Sorry? Hold your mic a little closer. Okay, I'll hold it a little closer like this. Good, so, so, uh, so I, I'm gonna end up saying the same thing, that, that I, I have come to think about the American identity as being the world identity for this reason. I've spent more than, uh, I guess, almost 15 years, uh, my wife Deb and I have been living outside the country, lots of years in China and Japan and Southeast Asia and Africa and, and in England. And one thing that strikes me is if we're having this discussion outside the United States, people would say, what do you mean the American identity? We can tell all of you a mile away. If all of us were walking down the street in Beijing, every one of us would be picked out as an American. And yet because of the way we carry ourselves, the kinds of uh, the culture we have, I once did a photo series on the Atlantic's website of having, having pictures of Asian Americans and Asian Asians taken in China and Japan and Thailand, and to 100% accuracy, people could pick out who were the Asian Americans and who were the, the, the Asians. The point is, I'm getting at it, is there is a strong identity Americans have in our culture, in our shared references, in our patriotism, and all, all the rest. What I have come to think is that from the rest of the world's assessment of our identity, there are parts they don't like. Violence is first on that list. The, the role of guns, the role of all the, the abuses they, they hear about and assign to all of us. But there's an implicit part of our identity that I think we might take even a little more seriously, which is so many people around the world don't think they necessarily want to become Americans. That, but, was, that was my next question, but, but actually. They, they is this a positive this, thing? It, it's a positive thing. They recognize this as an arena where they would like to become the best version of themselves. And the reason why, after many years of living in China, I've ended up being so positive on America's prospects in the long, world, in the long run is as long as we can be the place where an outsized proportion of the world's talented people think they can make a difference here, then that, that is a, a huge advantage that no one else can, can match. I'll say one other thing. The last almost two years now, Deb and I have been flying around the country looking at smaller cities as they've been coping with economic shocks or one thing kind or another. And there's a fascinating role of American identity we've seen there, which is strong local patriotism. And how would you like, you're the broadcast professional here, closer or farther away. So there's strong local patriotism which is indirectly reflecting on the American identity because people think about Allentown, Pennsylvania, or Greenville, South Carolina, or Columbus, Mississippi, or Fresno, Fresno, California. They think it still has the virtues they don't believe the rest of America still has. But there is a kind of sense that what we would think of as the good parts of the American identity are still present in places where people are you know, doing this in their own local communities. That's great. Ashanti. Thank you. Um, 
So I grew up in Oakland, California, and I grew up poor. I grew up with a single mother on welfare. My father died before I was born. So I didn't have a lot of conversations about what it meant to be American growing up. I just knew that I had to work really hard, and life was tough. Uh, my mom was raised in Little Rock, Arkansas. The reason she came to California was because my grandmother told her, you're gonna get us killed if you keep running your big mouth. <laughs> because my mom would not allow people to talk to her anyway. So she basically got sent away from Little Rock, Arkansas. My mom went to Central High School. But she taught me growing up, every year, PBS would have a would show Roots, and she would make sure every year we would sit home and we would watch every episode. And she taught me about what my history was about. And so I grew up knowing that I was black and that there were some issues in our country that I needed to know about, but in Oakland, I didn't have to worry about them because everyone was black and brown, the people I dealt with. I didn't realize about my Americanness until I got to college when people told me the only reason you got here was because of affirmative action. You got here because they had to let a few of you in. And I had to get really well versed on who I was as an American, being really clear that if we're gonna call this America, then we're all Americans. But if I'm gonna be American because I was born here, then this is my country. And so it was a lot growing up uh, trying to figure out, well, how do I identify when this society doesn't let me feel like I fit into the, to the mold? And so um, I, this is a great question, I think, for me, when I work with our young men, talking to them about what's going on in our country now, um, they don't say, Branch, why are they killing Americans to me? They ask me, why are they killing all the black men? And so my question to them always is around, well, what are your, think, what are your thoughts about it? Because I want them to be reflective and conscious about it, but I, I'm gonna stop there because that's my answer about my identity as American. I think, um, you know, I've, I've answered that. I've asked myself that question many times. Um, and now as an educator, as a person who grew up and realized that I had to work really hard and then I was gonna come back and give back to my community so that I can show them the way out. That's what it's about for me. Thanks. Um, full, full disclosure, when I first met Michelle, I discovered it was a black woman from Minnesota and I didn't know such a thing existed. So let's talk about identity. Well, when I think about identity, Gwen, I, I think about it as a Minnesotan, as a black woman, as a journalist, um, as someone who curates a project where stories about identity land in the inbox all the time. And I think about it most particularly around this time of the year because I was raised by um, a family that was deeply patriotic, my father in particular. On July 4th every year, he had a drawer where he kept little flags and he would put them out in his beautiful garden and he, he had socks that literally had the American flag on them. And as I got older and learned more about his story and his service in the military, I realized that he loved a country that didn't love him back. Um, he was someone who was looking at this country that he loved, but at the, at the margin, and saying, I too sing America, I too am American. And when we think about American identity, where it sometimes gets pinched is when we adorn it with adjectives. So someone who is truly American, someone who is genuinely American, um, someone who is unabashedly American. And that's when the, the definition gets very, very narrow. And they think that the idea of being an American, being all American, when you think about all American, you think of white picket fences and quarterbacks and apple pie. Well, in America, the concept of being all American right now is to, you know, is to have salsa instead of ketchup, is to watch soccer instead of baseball. And so the notion of being American is not necessarily set in stone. I think of it more like, like water on a rock. And the water is the people who come to America and the way that they add to Americanness through the traditions that they bring and the outlook that they bring and the way that they, they want to define Americanism. So to, uh, when I think of what it means to be American, it's not necessarily the card that you carry in your wallet. It's not necessarily the status that you have or the adjective that adjoins your version of America or the hyphen even. It's what you do as an American to push the country forward. It's how you contribute to America to create the kind of America that you want to live in. 
Hey, Jen. Um, so I think about the American identity through my experience growing up Asian American in an immigrant family, also raised by my grandmother, who's 89, and my personal heroine, um, and also a part of an organization that represents domestic workers and caregivers. And when we have our meetings, we have simultaneous interpretation in seven different languages. And one time we did an audit of all the different countries represented in the room, and there were 74. And so that is the, that is the sense of the place of American identity that I live in and come from. And so I think of, um, I think of this quote that Dr. Vincent Harding, the great civil rights leader, um, often said, which is that I am a citizen of a country that has yet to come into being. And I think that the American identity is a work in progress, just like the American democracy is a work in progress. And I think our identity should be as stewards of the next expression of what the American experience and experiment should look like. And I think that that looks like a range of things that are changing. And in this moment, there's so much changing about our racial demographics, our age demographics, our economic reality, the way that work works. And so we have to be also aware and inclusive of all the ways in which American identity is reflected back through that change. Great. Jack? And when I, when I think of my, my identity, it's not terribly complicated. Um, I've always thought of myself as an American. I'm fortunate to live in the greatest country in the world, notwithstanding all the challenges we have. I've had the privilege of traveling around the world, and we are the envy of the world, without a doubt. Having said that, the American dream that I got to be part of is no longer available for everybody, so I do recognize that, but the best way to describe the way I think about myself is when I left the South Bronx um, in the mid-70s and went to work for a firm called Deloitte. What the kids in the neighborhood called me was Jose Jaime Echeverria. So my mother called me, and Deloitte turned me into Joe Echeverria. <laughs> and that's the way I think about it. That's the immigrant story, that's the American dream. Um, and we change part of the world as we go along. America changes as we go along, but it's still the greatest nation in the world. Um, and that's the reason why. Thank you. And that's the reason why there's so many people who want to get here, because they want a chance at that dream. Our challenge is just to make sure that the people who are already here have a chance at the dream. And the journey I was able to take, others can take. I can't. I can't. I can't ask the questions of my panelists without answering it myself. I um, was born of immigrants who came to this country from the West Indies. I had an incredible appreciation for people who thought it was, uh, who did the bold act of uprooting themselves from everything they knew in order to make a better life for their children. We were the, like Michelle's father, craziest patriots on the block. It never occurred to us that we weren't American. In fact, we had chosen to become Americans, which seemed like a very um, empowering thing. But as in my current role, as I report day after day after day, all of our shortcomings in America, our shortcomings as Americans, I struggle, not with my patriotism or my love of the country, but to figure out how can we get over the humps, not the conversations, not the round tables, but how do we see each other? How do we begin to see ourselves and then see each other? It's so hard. We've discussed, discussed it in many, many different sessions here so far at Aspen, and it keeps returning in an interesting way to that theme, no matter what the topic is. So what we really want to do is hear that from you. You may have a question from the audience for the panel, or you may just have an observation that you want to share with us. Either way, we're going to spend the rest of our time here hearing back from you. Now, if you just raise your hands, I will do a little of my best Phil Donahue and come and find you so everybody else can hear you too. Not all at once. I knew I should have seated this audience. Hello. 
No, I'm not going to run. <laughs> the air is way too thin to run. <laughs> hi. Um, hi, I'm Janine. My name is Belle, J-I-N-N-Y-N, -N -N, which makes me unique. There's only two of us in the world, me and my cousin, who has the same name. I am a code switcher. I am racially ambiguous, which means that in many countries, I can just sort of fit in. I am white, I'm Latina, I am his, um, I'm Middle Eastern, I'm Irish, I'm Scottish, and it makes for, and I'm a woman, and I'm a woman who's lived in the Middle East, which has its own set of um, interesting dynamics. But one of the things that I wanted to bring to the, to the panel is, how, what is life like for those of us who maybe are a little bit racially ambiguous? Those of us who can, you know, maybe go undercover, but yet be advocates for the communities in which we represent. Thank you. Michelle, you get a lot of these kinds of comments in your race card file, so give us a couple of the answers. Well, first of all, we might need to uh, help the audience with the definition of code switching. So do you want to take yes. that on? Yes. Code switching is when I am on the air and I say, tonight the news is, and then I go home and say, girl, let me tell you what the news was. <laughs> And I'm usually the one that gets that phone call. <laughs> so if you heard the two of us talking, as we do every single day, we don't necessarily sound the way we do when we're behind microphones. That's code switching. Um, but lots of people do that. And that no is not necessarily a negative thing. That is a, that's being bicultural in the way that being bilingual will help you move forward in the world. Being bicultural will help you. Jim, when you travel around, I imagine that you code switch to some degree. Uh, yes, and, I, and so I will tell you about I, I, the code switching cue. I wanted to talk about just something to connect with what Ashanti was saying. A reason I thought, one of the many reasons the president's speech this last week was so important, I thought, was not simply the glory of the composition of that speech, which, which I thought was his, a, a masterfully crafted speech, but the fact that by his own code switching, he embodied rather than explained the fact that he encompassed all these different strands of America in himself. But when people talked yeah. about it, when journalists in yes. our profession talked about it, they talked about it as if it was this strange thing, like he was taking off one hat and putting on another, that it was strategic when it's something that, that people of color do right. all the time. And I posit that people, people all over the place, if you were Southern, Yep. I bet that you can be as country as a sugar sandwich when you go home. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's true. And, and yet when you walk into the workplace, that yep. somehow drops. So when we lived in Japan, our two sons, who were then in elementary school, they both had bright blonde hair, bright blue eyes, went to Japanese public school. The school I went to had never before had a non-Japanese student there. They learned two things. One was all about code switching, the way they could speak, you know, colloquial Japanese and English with us and all the rest. The other thing that I actually did an Atlantic article about is I said every white American should have to go to Japanese school for a year or two to recognize what it's like to be aware of your race every second. Every second your race was the first thing about you. And as a white American, I say, yeah, yeah, you know, race doesn't really matter. But so they, they learn to code switch, and as foreigners, you do that too. And so, yes. So the last we are going thing to I will say about okay. that that's most reflective in the race card project is the question of where are you really from? Because you're talking about being able to live in lots of different places and, and code switch, but on the other side of that equation is someone who looks at you and in their mind is going through the mental calculation, what is she? Do I just assume something or do I ask? And that's, for me, in the inbox, that's one of the most frequent submissions I get, some version of where are you really from or you know, who, who are you really? I have another question over here, panel, to your left. You're going to hold that mic. Okay, cool. Um, so I was in Europe speaking at a conference, and a guy from Finland came up to describe his opinion of America, and I want to give it now. Um, he asked everyone in the, in the room, mostly not from America, how many people thought that America was on the downturn, was sinking, and most hands went up. And then he said, let me tell you why you're wrong. Um, if I move to France and I have a child with a French woman, that child will never be French. If I move to Japan, you know, generations, that child will never be Japanese. I could go to America right now, become a citizen in seven years, and I'm American. 
And that made me feel really, really good. And that's the strength, I think, of this country, is that we're a melting pot. And we get the best when we can. And uh, so I just want to say that. Elizabeth? Well, um, to, to your point, um, I think that it's important to, um, to think about the way that we have always been. This is, this is to immigration. What does it mean to be an immigra immigrant nation, not just now, but from the outset? If you go and look at very, very early American literary anthologies, the first ones by English people who had just come to this country, they were not Americans, they became Americans. They're writing about what, is, what does it mean to be American, and I think that part of the energy that is great about here is about that constant movement and turnover, but not without, of course, the terrible, terrible, uh, um, it, it, you can't even call them growing pains, of the resistance to who gets to be called original, who calls themselves original, and when do we say immigration began, right? Immigration is not new. Um, I think also um, I wanted to add to the very interesting question that was asked over here about code switching. Um, I think that um, to, to your specifics, I think that for people who are in bodies that are ambiguously readable, and I'm sure in some places, you know, when you're with your aunties, they know just what you are, right? <laughs> but um, that, that, that you talk about going undercover, and I think that for people who are ambiguously readable, it is crucial to bear witness to the kind of xenophobia that people have against each other that you sometimes might have the misfortune to witness. You have to be a righteous ally if you are in that position. And I think it's also really important to point out, so this is really just speaking to the two questions, which bodies are inescapable right now in America? What does it mean to be in a body that is not ambiguous? You know, what does it mean to be my black sons walking on the street in those bodies all the time? It means many things. It doesn't all mean dangerous and bad things but it also does mean a kind of vulnerability and no one is gonna read them out of those bodies. So I think that's an important thing to recognize as well. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving along so we can get as many questions as possible, hi. Hi, good afternoon. My question um, has to do with narrative creation, specifically for African Americans. I find often that we're talked about as a monolith that we're coming from situations of poverty, we don't have our fathers, things of that nature, and it's absolutely true. But at what point does that narrative become the only defining narrative for the black community, and in some instances, hurt other efforts that are happening? Um, I particularly work in economic development and with entrepreneurs, and I feel as though I'm oftentimes always starting the conversation with, no, this is not social services, when I'm talking to people who are not black. Um, as though I need to start with that as the baseline because to be black means that you are poor, to be black means that you don't have education. And I always have to communicate that we're not a monolith. So I'd love you know, for us to talk about what is a new narrative that can be created for the fact that the black community and communities of color are very buried in this country. Let me ask Ashanti to take that one on. So I wanna make sure I understood the question. So then what new narrative do we need to tell ourselves or what narrative do we need to let everyone else know? I think what opportunities should we be taking to continue to talk about additional narratives that exist in our community? Because I think oftentimes we spend time talking about one as though it is the only narrative that exists. Well, thank you. Um, so my job on a daily basis, I'm a vice principal at a middle school. And so as you imagine, seven, I'm a seventh grade administrator this year. They have an opinion about everything. And so the narrative for our, our seventh grade class this year was, you know, be your best self. Now I work at a school that's in the hills of Oakland, so 50% of our kids come from the hills, and 50% come from the heartland of Oakland. So we have a very diverse, we're one of the most diverse schools in Oakland. And what the narrative for our students, our white students, our African American, our Latino students, is really for, the, my questions to them is always around whatever incident happens, fight, behavior, is, what are you trying to be right now? Like, who are you trying to be? Like, like if you're the receiving end of it, um, what happened? Why do you think it happened? Um, is it about the color? Um, I think for me, um, that narrative for our young people, we have to start the narrative earlier. For our young people, if you're a young person of color growing up in a poor environment and you don't have a lot of resources, um, you could get stuck into the narrative that, well, there's no resources for me, so therefore I can't do anything. But my job, 
I believe, is to help them see past that. What do you want to happen in, this, in your life? And then really giving them tools so that they can uh, reach for those tools. That's how I believe we change the narrative. Can I ask Joe to weigh in on that too briefly? Sure. And um, you know, it's interesting because if you, you look at this from a Hispanic lens, that's a, that's a label in of itself. And if you ask the Hispanic person, are you Hispanic? Or are you Latino or Latina? People don't know how to answer that. If you ask that to my mother, she would say, I don't know where this Latin thing came from. We're Hispanic. <laughs> Why? Because she views herself being associated somehow with the Spanish from Europe. And she likes that association better. If you, if you asked me, Puerto Rican, I'm from the Bronx, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know anything about this Hispanic thing. Um, and I think the challenge is your narrative has to be focused on what it is you're trying to accomplish. And I think to try to get it all into one narrative is hard. And so your narrative needs to be incredibly focused to the audience you're expressing the narrative to. So in My Brother's Keeper, the narrative is very focused. It's not about the ones who've done it. It's about the ones who have not. And we're not trying to paint a brush around that. We're just trying to identify that a disproportionate number have not yet had the dream. Doesn't mean there aren't some that did. They just happen to be the minority, no pun intended. So I think that's a challenge. Like I said, even in my own race, when we get into politics, I say, you shouldn't talk about the Cubans and immigration. They have political asylum. Don't talk about the Puerto Ricans. We got rights to this country in the 50s. We're not the ones voting on immigration. It's interesting, though. The narrative is quite complicated in race. It was much simpler in gender, because everybody was touched at some point by a woman in their life. Race is really complicated, very complicated. OK, I'm back here straight back with another question. OK, um, my question is kind of about the American dream, which is something that many of you talked about in your American identity. Do you think the American dream is dead? And that idea of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and you know, having a white picket fence is something that no longer exists. Is that something that has changed into something else? Or is it, that it something that is altogether non-existent anymore? Hi, Jen. Well, I think the topic of this conversation um, throughout this festival in terms of the endangered American dream is a topic because I think that there are real threats to the future of the American dream and that there have been real barriers to many communities for a long time in being able to achieve the dream. And that's what we're here to talk about is how do we unlock that? How do we tr take this moment of change when our economy is changing, when our demographics are changing, to actually seize upon opportunities to strengthen the American dream and make it the inclusive dream um, that it was always meant to be. I think that there are some real realities. The fact that wages, real wages, haven't increased for 30 years, that um, low wage work is expanding, that two thirds of all minimum wage workers are women many of whom are mothers. There are a lot of real hard economic realities out there and still millions of people without work. And so I think we have to really look honestly at those challenges and come up with solutions, develop solutions in our culture, in our systems, in our policy that actually reopen up the American dream, which will look different in this new moment in the 21st century. It's a moment of opportunity and reinvention. OK. We don't have a lot of time left, so I have somebody who promises to make a really quick comment from an indigenous perspective, and then I'm going to take the final question. OK. Hami takuye pi, yushki amwachi anka piye, Carly Bad Harpo and Makia piye. I said, hello, my friends and relatives. My name is Carly Bad Harpo. I'm happy to see you all here today. I'm excited to be here. Um, I just wanted to, I, I felt the responsibility to say something as an indigenous person to this land. I'm Dakota from the Flandreau Santee Sioux Tribe. <laughs> and our, our people very often are left out of the conversation um, in many ways. Um, and uh, I had the honor of speaking on a panel at the, at, at the this festival um, where we talk just about that. And so I just want to encourage everyone as we're having conversations like this, to please remember to include our indigenous people because when you look at the disparities across this country, our indigenous people are at the bottom. Um, and very often that is, no, that is not mentioned. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done in those communities and we ask that you reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
talk about original American identity. I'm glad we got that in. Last question. Hello, my name is Stella from Mozambique, student at African Leadership Academy. I have a question. Imagine that you are black. What will be your position in racism? And for everyone, another question is, become a leader or work for community. What you, would you like or what would you die for? I think that's something everybody can give us a brief answer to. Starting with you, Elizabeth. The, qu the question being, well, I heard the second part is what would you die for? Yes. And the first part? Imagine that you are black. Imagine that. Imagine. I don't have to imagine. <laughs> yes, okay. okay. Don't imagine, feel. Yes. Close your eyes and feel that you are black. What will be your position about racism? About racism. Um, I'm a black woman who comes from a long line of race people, as we call them. And I was always taught that struggling in any way, if you struggle with poems, if you struggle in your small community, if you struggle as a teacher, if you try to change housing laws, if you try to bring more job opportunities to people, that it's your responsibility to remember Anna Julia Cooper's words, when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me. And you can substitute for race, we all move forward together in a better way. What would I die for? My children. That's it. Jim, our token white guy. Yes, uh, the, the what I would die for answer is going to be the same. My, my children, my family, the opportunities of those I love. Um, I'm a white man who spent a lot of time in places where I was the minority, sometimes a favored minority, sometimes not. I've thought a lot about the mixture of race in our country. On the one hand, the great success of America is that immigration is always disruptive, always painful, but we've been able to take it better than other countries have. So we've been able to have its, its benefits, notwithstanding our two original sins involving race. One is the treatment of the Native Americans, the other is slavery and its aftermath. And so I've spent, Deb and I have been in a lot of reservations recently, and I, I very much echo those. So I think that, that to view America from inside and outside is to recognize we struggle with these legacies of our original sins. Ashanti. Um, on racism, that's a really tough question. And I, I, I feel like, uh, I, I could feel myself getting excited um, about that, that question. So what I would say about racism is that we have work to do in this country. And if we don't um, open our eyes to what's going on in our communities, um, we are gonna have a lot more trouble in our communities. Um, what I die for, what I work every day for is creating a world of freedom, teaching our youth to break their chains so they can live more free. Michelle, we have to wrap this up really quickly, so quick answers. What I would die for my children who are here in this, this room, this tent with me, um, but I hope that some, in some ways in the distance and so I choose to live strongly and aggressively and boldly toward making the world a better place for them. On the question of being a black woman, I am a black woman, and where, where, I, where and when I enter, I represent a multitude of black women, and so I hope that you all think about the danger of a single story that we all represent, and that's true for all of us, whether you are a blonde woman, whether you're a white male financier, whether you're an American Indian, there are many stories and they cannot be told through one narrow narrative. Black Lives Matter. And I'm a part of a group of Asians who call themselves Asian, Asians for Black Lives. And I am because um, I believe that until we address the many ways in which we valued black lives differently in this country, that we won't ever achieve the kind of healthy democracy that we know we all deserve. And that's the democracy that I would die for because that's the democracy that I know my kids and everyone here deserves. Yeah. 49 seconds. I'm looking at the timer. You can do it. I can do this. Um, first of all, what I would do is, is, is try to remind everybody to, as much as you like to live in a circumstance, you need to live in the vision. It's very different. Um, and what would I die for? It's not terribly complicated besides what was already said. I'd die solely for one thing, the freedom that you're granted in the United States of America. That's what I'd die for. Please thank my panel.